Okay, let's uh, have a look at the class Echinoidea, which is the third class in the phylum Echinodermata. It will take uh, surprising shapes from the shape that you know well, the um, kinna, uh, to these very odd ones that look just like limpets, and unsurprisingly, because they live in high winter wave and energy environments, they don't want to get swept off the rocks, so they take a form that is very similar to limpets. They have very similar lifestyles. They are the sea urchins, sand dollars, and heart urchins. Uh, and rather than having the connective tissue within um, between the ossicles, the ossicles are fused into an internal shell called a test. So they have skin over the shell, and the shell is called a test. All the ossicles are fused together. So the test we just saw is a series of alternating ambulacral, uh, and like we saw in the asteroidians, the ambulacral grooves were where the, poo the two feet came out, and the interambulacral inter areas are where there are no two feet coming out of the test. Okay, plates have um, spines attached to the bumps or the tubercles, and the spines usually, um, for those of you who have had uh, kin of spines break off inside and get infected, you know that they often have uh, poison sacs or they tend to get, um, they tend to react negatively once they're broken off inside of you. And they do have pedicillaria as well. Here we see the tubercles. Let me get my pen up and we'll go with yellow. So here we see a tubercle, and you see tubercles for large spines, tubercles for small spines. Um, they have a um, this thing called the periproct, which is at the top, and that's when you find a kinetest in the wild. It usually has a hole at the top, and this one is not fused, so this area is not fused, but has loosely connected uh, um, ossicles. There's an anus where all the, the wastes come out at uh, the top. The madreporite is on a um, particular ossicle at the top. Here is another picture of the tubercle. I think we'll go red. So right here, this tubercle. And it's much like the ball of a ball and socket joint uh, going up to the spine. The spine is right here. And they've got muscles all around the outside that can move the spine in any direction. And if you go and touch an urchin, you'll see that the spines move in response to that touch. Uh, they also have um, two feet coming out through um, holes in the ambulacral areas, pedicel area, tall spines and small spines in our classic kinna. Here is a nice view of what the kinna spine looks like if you magnify it. And you can see so that it's not meant to hold things to it, it's meant as a defensive weapon. It's actually quite difficult for something to slide this way. Uh, the barbs try to keep the, uh, the organisms that might attack it in the distance. Okay, so they have buccal podia, okay, and those are little tube feet that are modified um, in for manipulating food. Okay. They have a structure called the um, Aristotle's lantern. We'll have another look at that. This also is uh, loosely connected. And when you find a kinetest, that hole is gone in the, in the bottom. Here are the modified buccal podia, which are, and a podia is a tube foot. Okay, so that's the regular urchins. The irregular urchins are slightly different. They have uh, lots of very short spines. It's kind of a fur-like appearance. Uh, you may have found the tests of these at Pilot Bay without even knowing what you were 
finding, but these are irregular urchins, and they have very few um, feet. They're more sol they're more deposit feeders rather than using their uh, tube feet to collect food. And they also have secondary bilateral symmetry, so they have the the pentamerous radial symmetry, which you'll see, but they also have a bilateral symmetry, which is because they only move one direction through the substrate. So it's more efficient to um, be bilaterally symmetrical and um, have directional movement. Here you can see a large irregular urchin and the red really didn't show up all that well. Let's try white. So white, you can see the line of symmetry, how it's a secondary uh, bilateral symmetry and you can see all the, the small spines all laying in one direction, which means that um, it moves through the substrate very easily. Uh, they have the something called the petaloids on the top, uh, which are where the podia, uh, which are more adapted for respiration, for breathing, stick out. And here is how they work. So to move away from white, go back to the red. And so here are the podia that stick out. They're at the top of the urchin test, of the asymmetrical urchin test, and they stick out through the substrate. So you don't really see these as they're moving through the, through the um, sediment in this direction, just eating any old dirt that comes along. They're not selective deposit feeders. Here again, you can see the petaloid on the top, okay? And again here, and it shows you that they have that pentamerous radial symmetry, but uh, sec also the secondary bilateral symmetry as well. Sorry, right down the middle. Uh, the, the sand dollars tend to be um, less bilaterally symmetrical, uh, even though they do move in one direction. Um, they do have secondary bilateral symmetry, but it's not as pronounced. They're round, and you can see the pentamerous radial symmetry. Now here are their spines. They're modified into little clubs, and the two feet um, are really only collect um, food off of the, the bottom and pass it to the mouth. So these are more selective deposit feeders. They sort of collect a mucus-filled ball with the tube feet. The spines, these little, the ones that are circled here, you can see how they would get a nice grip, and they're what used, is used to move the animal through the substrate, or across the top of the substrate. Here are how the tube feet work. There's a bolus of food. It's a mucus is slung between the, um, two feet and when it picks up particles they pass it down the groove with the tube feet to the mouth. You'll notice that the tube feet don't stick out as far as the spines. Okay, as we've seen some of them are deposit feeders, some of them are non-selective deposit feeders, um, but most of them graze on algae. They will eat other things though, They're, they can scavenge a little bit and they'll eat animal material. They often eat the uh, Coralina paint, um, but we know that uh, Kinna, anyway, can uh, clear areas and create a Kinna Baron by eating all the algae. Their Aristotle's lantern will essentially bite off little chunks, and if you open a Kinna, you'll often find that it's full of little green balls of algae. Here's a picture of the Aristotle's lantern. And if you look at the bottom of a kinna, you'll see the way the five teeth come together. You can only see three on this image. Okay, but they, and they grow. Here's the length of the, the uh, tooth. It's constantly growing like a chipmunk's tooth. There's a nice animation on the PowerPoint. Uh, there's a URL for the power for the animation of how this works. 
Now, once they've torn off those chunks of algae, uh, then you'll see that they, you can trace the pathway through this very long intestine. We'll trace that along. And the reason it's long is because they're plant eaters generally. And if you look at plant eaters, okay, out through the anus here, in through the mouth, Okay, so that's a one-way gut or a two-way gut. It's a one-way gut, of course. So if you look at plant eaters, you'll find that they often have very long intestines. And animals that eat um, other animals tend to have very short intestines. Uh, that's because it takes a long time to break down the cellulose and plant walls, uh, cell walls of plants in order to get the nutrition out. Uh, in reproduction, they tend to be broadcast spawners. They're dioecious, so if you eat kinna, you'll find that some are white and milky, and some are more orange, and guess which ones are the males, okay, with sperm rather than eggs. Uh, they have this really beautiful larva called uh, an echinopluteus larva. Uh, you probably, you're not really responsible for knowing that, but it is, uh, I'll show you a picture of it. There that is. Very beautiful. Very spiny. And one last little feature. You'd think that the um, one like this wouldn't be, go very well in a high wave energy environment. But these things actually wedge themselves into crevices that they chemically dissolve out of the rock using spines. And then they catch drifting algae on their spines and with their tube feet, they sort of move it around to the to the mouth. So this is a um, a type of urchin that lives in the West India Indian Ocean. Okay, that's it for echinoderms or echinoidea.